This demonstration is going to be a continuation of the Uncensorable Publishing series of videos at uncensorablepublishing.com. The focus of this video is going to be on the web server side of things. Um, so the software that actually serves a Gatsby website uh, to the end user. And um, so it's focused on Gatsby websites and it includes what I'm going to show today is how to include a CI CD webhook. So CI stands for continuous integration and CD stands for continuous deployment. And this video is really going to focus on the continuous deployment side of things by implementing a webhook so that when you make a change to the source code of your Gatsby site and then push that change to GitHub, the webhook will trigger a deployment. And so a, a complex series of actions, of automated actions, will happen to update the, the live site in production. And one of the things that's really unique about this web server is that it's, it's a series of Docker containers that publish simultaneously to the ClearWeb, Tor, and IPFS. And I'm going to show uh, what each of this is before I go into actually looking at the code and the setup. Uh, but this video is going to run through everything. It's going to introduce uh, all the ideas and show step by step how to set it up for your own website. So real quick, let me just show the different networks. Uh, so we're all familiar with the clear web. And if you go to uncensorablepublishing.com, you can see the site that we're going to use in the example uh, today. And um, so this is the typical clear website where you have the .com and the .net and the .org type websites. Uh, but there are, there's the deep web. There's these other internets um, that, that run in parallel to the clear web. And one of the, the most popularly known ones is Tor, the onion router. And so if you scroll to the bottom of uncensorablepublishing.com, you'll see these links to the different networks. Now, in a normal web browser, if I click on this, nothing will happen or it won't display anything. In fact, let's just see what happens when I click on it. Yeah, it says server not found because this is a Tor address and you know it's a Tor address because it ends in .onion. And so there's a whole separate web browser called the Tor browser that can browse Tor websites. But Brave browser has... Um, integrated it so if you open Tor browser and go to the new private window with Tor it will open a private window and you'll see this Tor icon displayed in the upper right hand corner and that'll let you know that it uses the Tor website so what I did is I copied and pasted that Tor link into the web browser here and you can see this is a mirror image of the same website, but this is being broadcast over Tor. Tor is an anonymizing network, so it, it lets you browse websites anonymously. And so that's one of the big features of this web server is um, I could actually turn off the clear web if I wanted to just produce a web app that's accessible over Tor, or I can simultaneously have my website accessible over Tor and the clear web. And then finally, there's this interplanetary file system, IPFS, and they look even stranger where IPFS websites are just a hash. This is a, a cryptographic hash that starts with QM. And uh, I have that open here. I clicked on that link and it opened this tab here. And what's really unique about this is whereas Tor, the emphasis is on privacy, in IPFS, the emphasis is more on censorship resistance. And so I can go to multiple, IPFS.io is just a gateway of which there are hundreds of gateways and anybody can easily set up a gateway. And so I could go to any of those gateways and put this hash in and get the same website. And it, this is a very difficult to censor uh, web technology. So these are both examples of the deep web, Tor and IPFS, uh, and there are advantages and disadvantages to, to building a website for all these different networks, 
And what I'm going to show today is this web server that lets you simultaneously broadcast the same website over all three networks. And then for your business use case, you can choose to use all three or to use two of the three or one of the three. In any combination, they can be turned on and turned off. Uh, and then finally, I want to show this memo.cache profile which is also here at the end if you um, I have it open in this tab and what you'll see here memo.cash is like Twitter it's a social media platform but it uses the Bitcoin cash blockchain and because the data is on the blockchain it can't be censored and it can't be tampered with you can't be deplatformed and because these IPFS hashes are so hard to track writing new updated hashes to the blockchain is an excellent way to coordinate uh, these automated systems uh, because of the the tamper resistance or, or, or tamper guarantees uh, of putting data on the blockchain and the always available content guarantees uh, it's it's an excellent foundation for software like I'm going to show today to coordinate around so that's that's mo pretty much what I'm going to show today, and, and let's um, this this video is a, co a continuation of a previous video uh, on the decentralized publishing overview, and that's available on YouTube at this link here, and it looks like this with the title "Decentralized Publishing Overview." It's also linked here at um, uncensorablepublishing.com on how governments censor content. So this that was a non-technical video. This is a technical video that is going to cover the back end or server side of things. And in that first video, I introduced this picture, which is a graphical representation of, of what I'm going to show today, which is the server block. So real quick to recap... I'm on my development laptop here, which is where I develop the website. I would push the changes to the website to the GitHub repository. And what we're going to set up today is a webhook so that when we push changes to GitHub, it will automatically trigger a webhook to the server, which will kick off the build of these three Docker containers, which will serve the, which will tap into the IPFS network and the BCH blockchain. It'll serve the website uh, to normal users in a web browser and the normal user behavior doesn't need to change but it will simultaneously broadcast that same content over the Tor network for people who want to use Tor and, and be private and then the data is uploaded to the IPFS network and all these second order uh, users can access it over the IPFS network and uh, this is particularly advantageous for censorship resistance. So so today, or in this video, I'm focusing on this server block. This is essentially the software we're going to be running. So the code that this video is going to focus on is in the github.com permissionless software foundation group and the repository is called Docker Gatsby Web Server. And I've got it here in the tab. So again, permissionless software foundation on GitHub. This is the Docker Gatsby Web Server. We're setting up Docker containers that serve a Gatsby website and is ultimately a web server. And I've got installation instructions, which is what I'm going to walk through, as well as usage instructions. Uh, so I'm going to walk through in this video, and I'm going to uh, link to this video in the readme here so that people have both a written and visual uh, introduction and instructions on on the installation so I've got I've got it running locally and uh, I need to shrink my window just so you can see what it looks like but um, ultimately what you're gonna what you're going to end up with is three Docker containers running at the same time. The first one is this. Un so we're what we're running right now is the web server for 
uncensorablepublishing.com. And so that's the Unsen pub. That's what that means. The Nginx is a very common web server. Um, Nginx and Apache are the two most common web servers. In this case, we're using Nginx. So there's one Docker container which contains the Nginx web server, and that's what's serving the website over the clear web. And this is the same exact web server I'm using at uncensorablepublishing.com. Uh, even, but I'm running it locally here on my machine just so I can show the three Docker containers. There's the second Docker container, which is the Tor Docker container. And essentially what it's doing is it's taking the output of the Nginx and piping it over Tor. And it's creating this, uh, this Tor address, or hidden service as it's called. And then there's this third container, which is running an IPFS node, and it has compiled a special IPFS version of the website to uh, that that you can mostly the differences in the links I'll, I'll go into it on in a little bit more detail in a minute but it's basically doing the same thing but it's serving the IPFS version of the website over the IPFS network and that's where that hash comes from <clears throat> So that's the code. This is the website that uh, we're running with it. And, uh, and so the, the front end, the actual Gatsby code, is also in the Permissionless Software Foundation group area. Uh, and it's called Gatsby IPFS template. This is literally the same code that's running at uncensorablepublishing.com. So this is a Gatsby template. Uh, both of these software is open source and MIT licensed, so we invite people to take them and fork them and, and, and start with this Gatsby template and this web server and customize it for their own needs. Uh, but anyways, this is where to find it and to find the code. So with that, uh, I'm going to go into the actual demo and show how to set up this web server to serve a Gatsby website with a CI CD webhook with GitHub and publish simultaneously to the web tour and IPFS. So setup, uh, I'm assuming here that you already have a registered domain with an SSL certificate. So uh, I had a <laughs> incorrectly typed domain name that I was uh, able to use called Cascade Blockchain. I was trying to spell Cascade, but I missed the C. And so anyways, this is just some sort of junk domain name that I'm going to get rid of, so I thought it would be a good example. And so notice it's got the, the S, the HTTPS, so that's the SSL encryption. So I've already, I have this domain name, I have uh, Nginx running on the server, and I've already gotten a Let's Encrypt uh, SSL certificate. And sites, uh, so it's Nginx, sites available. If you've ever worked with Nginx, this will look familiar. Otherwise, you should probably stop here and learn a little bit about Nginx. But this is the uh, configuration file that I'm running. Um, so it's running on both port 80 and port 443. And um, these are the, the confirmation or the configuration files for the SSL stuff. And it's piping the uh, website over to the Docker container, the clear web Docker container is essentially uh, the broad strokes there. So I'm, I'm going to assume that you have your domain and a web server you're using Nginx, you've got an SSL cert, uh, all that stuff, that's a lot, um, but it's outside the scope of this video in terms of setting it up, uh, so I'm going to assume that's what you have going into this. Uh, so that, real quick, I'm going to run through all the installation steps and then I'll come back and we'll do each one. So the first step is to create a new Bitcoin Cash wallet and I'll show how to do that. And then create a memo.cache account and import the private key so that the wallet and the account are linked because the memo.cache account uh, profile is what's going to track the IPFS uh, hash. And the reason why this is important 
is it let uh, it lets other people if if there is a sen- an issue with censorship if someone tries to censor your website other people can look at this uncensorable social media profile and get the latest hash and help you uh, distribute your website by running their own copies of this web server and uh, very quickly mirror your your website and take and leverage the Streisand effect, which is this self-defeating phenomenon where the more uh, an authority tries to censor something, it actually causes more attention to be brought to it and causes that thing to be shared more widely and actually makes it harder to censor. So the, the more effort they put into censoring something, it actually defeats that objective and makes it even more difficult to censor. That's the Streisand effect. And, uh, and so this all leverages that effect where if somebody tries to actually censor something, um, it makes it less likely for them to succeed in censoring it. It's a very powerful and important phenomenon that has only existed since the birth of the internet. Uh, and so anyways, that's why the memo.cache account is important. Uh, then we're going to install Docker and then install Docker Compose. <clears throat> we're going to clone that web server repository. We're going to customize this environment variables file, which lets you customize the web server for, for your website. And... Uh, one of the things that the web server assumes is that the Gatsby website has both a build and a build IPFS script. And let me show you what that looks like in the, this is the Gatsby IPFS template. So this is the, the source code for uncensorablepublishing.com. And if you look at the package.json file, there are two scripts. There's build, which is just the normal Gatsby build, and then there's this build IPFS, which uses this prefix paths uh, tag, which affects how the relative links are built, uh, because they have to be done slightly differently with IPFS. And if you go into the Gatsby config.js file, you'll see these two different ways of building. Um, so there's the normal configuration and then there's the IPFS configuration that is uh, used when the prefix paths is used. So these are the difference between the two. The biggest difference is this IPFS plugin which helps Gatsby compile a website for distribution over IPFS. So we will uh, build the containers and then update Nginx to point to those containers. Uh, and so you can see here in this example, Cascade blockchain, um, this is just the normal Nginx. This is what you get by default when you first install Nginx and you haven't customized it at all. So we'll customize that and point it at the at the new Docker containers. After we've got the Docker containers up and running, we'll install Node.js and npm, uh, pm2 and webhook cli. So webhook cli is an npm package that lets you u- utilize GitHub webhooks, and then pm2 is a process manager. So it just it just runs the webhook cli uh, app in the background uh, all the time. And uh, and then finally, we'll we'll create a webhook on GitHub and we'll trigger it and show that it works and and we'll rebuild those Docker containers whenever you push a change to the master branch of your repository. Okay, so this is going to be a long one. Let's go ahead and get started. I'm going to try and move fast, but uh, since this is a video, you can pause it and rewind and watch. So, um, again, I'm assuming that you're starting with a registered domain with an SSL certificate. You don't have to. You can still do all this stuff with just an IP address or a domain without an SSL certificate. Uh, All this stuff still works, but for most web apps, it's pretty common today to assume that you're going to have a domain name with an SSL certificate. Uh, So, let's create a new... Bitcoin Cash Wallet, and the easiest way to do that 
is I'm going to open up a new private window and I'm going to go to wallet.fullstack.cache. And I'm going to open up Adam because we're going to need to take some notes as we go and probably look at some code. This is actually the environment variable file that we're going to be um, customizing. Okay, so now if we go back over to wallet.fullstack.cache, we're going to click on this button and create a new wallet. And we're going to normally you would never show the mnemonic or the private key to anybody but this is a disposable wallet I'm gonna get rid of it so I'm just gonna go ahead and show it in the video here and this 12 word mnemonic is what you'll use to restore it the wallet if you uh, so that you don't lose funds this string with the letter K is a private key and with format and you'll it, it'll start with either the letter K or the letter L and we're going to need this to create our memo.cash uh, account. We're also going to need this Bitcoin Cash address, and we're going to need to send some Bitcoin Cash to that address. So we've got these three pieces of information. Uh, now we can go to memo.cash and create a new uh, account. So we click on sign up, and let's see, I'm going to say... Let's call it um, web server demo three two one and password. I'm gonna pick um, going gets tough. All right, let's copy that over here. And we're going to import the with private key from our wallet. That's going to link the wallet with the account. And then accept the terms of service and click sign up. Okay, we've got an account. Uh, we have zero Bitcoin cash. And also our wallet is showing zero Bitcoin cash. So I am going to load up my normal wallet and send... 10 cents of Bitcoin cash to that address. Okay. So now if we go back, we can refresh and see that we have 10 cents and we can also refresh our memo.cash and uh, see that we have a balance. Now normally at this point I would recommend going to the account tab and filling in this information, your name and your profile and your profile picture, but we're going to skip that for now because it doesn't really affect what we're trying to do. Um, so we created a new wallet, we created a new account and we imported the key. Now it's time to install the prerequisites. Now I may already have Docker installed on here. I do. Um, but the instructions are in the repository. So this is the Docker Gatsby web server. This is what we're focusing on in this video. If you scroll down, um, assuming that you're using Ubuntu, uh, you can just follow these commands to install Docker and follow these commands right here to install Docker Compose. So here in this example server, we've already got Docker installed and Docker Compose installed as well. And uh, so really all we need to do now is clone this repository, this Docker Gatsby web server repository. Git clone. And now we can go in there, and there's an IPFS directory, there's an Nginx Tor directory, and a config directory, and then a Docker Compose file, which 
organizes all the things. Now you shouldn't need to modify any of this. The only thing that you need to change is if you go into the config file, there is a, an example end vars, uh, and that stands for environment variables. You want to copy that and re and copy the copy should be named n vars. There we go. And that's illustrated right here in step three of, of the README. So let's take a look at that. This is what the what the file looks like. And I'm just gonna open it in my code editor so that there's a little more color. Um, this is the these environment variables they control everything and this is the only file that you need to customize everything else uh, is just boilerplate and so what I have here in the default uh, values is DC name is the docker container name it's it's the prefix that all of your docker containers are gonna get set with so if we go back over here and look at the containers I have running that's where this unsend pub came from. So these three containers are running the uncensorable publishing website. And uh, so you can run multiple copies of this. Like, so you can run multiple websites on the same server. And that's why this prefix is handy, is it lets you know which Docker containers belong to which website. Um, and then you've got to tell it the the Gatsby, the GitHub repo for the Gatsby website. So we're using this Gatsby IPFS template. Uh, and and then it you know, also sometimes it just needs to uh, know the name of it directly. So we have it repeated here in this repo dir variable. And then we're going to set the port for Nginx. So right now it's set to 3123. And then we're going to set the port for the IPFS node to communicate with other IPFS nodes. And um, this does not need to be changed. It, it'll pick up on the on the port number here. And then here we need to add the address and the width for the memo.cache account. And so we have that information right here. Oh, and actually, I want to edit the file on the server. So I'm going to do this over the command line using nano text editor. And so everything here can stay the same since in this example, I'm just going to use this same template. And I just need to change the Bitcoin cash address and the width key so that it uses the memo.cache account that we just created. Now, if I go get status, you'll see there's no files listed. So this nvars file is in the git ignore. So this lets you put private information in that file and, and make sure that it's not going to end up in the GitHub repository. That's, that's the main advantage of using environment variables like we're doing here. So now that this is customized, uh, and I didn't go into how to install Docker, but I showed the instructions on how to uh, install Docker in the README. Uh, we can, if we go, if we say Docker PS, we can see that there's no no Docker containers running on the server right now. We can kick off the build like this web server is ready to go. It's ready for us to pull the trigger because we edited the nvars file, and now we can kick it off by running this build images uh, bash shell script. And so I'm going to stop this. And so if you're not familiar with bash shell scripts, you do that with do, uh, period forward slash. Or I could go um, bash uh, build. The word bash. They, they, they both work. And uh, so that, that would kick off the, the build. And at the end of it, it would look like this. Um, oops. We'd have three Docker containers just like we do over here 
in this window that's running locally. So I'm going to go ahead and do that and kick that build off and we'll let that run. Um, I showed how to customize the environment files. I talked about uh, how a site, the Gatsby site, needs both a build and a build IPFS script. So this build script gets run in the Nginx Docker container, and then this gets run in the IPFS Docker container. And, uh, and so right now we've kicked off the build, so it's actively building the containers. When this is done, we'll update Nginx. And then once we verified that uh, the clear web version of the site is functioning correctly, uh, we will add the webhook and um, and set up GitHub to automatically um, update uh, update the server whenever we push a change to the website. So in fact, I need to take a step back and customize this for the webhook. So I'm going to stop the the build because I just realized we're not going to be able to use the uh, permissionless software version of the repo. We need to fork it first. So I'm just going to clean up. Okay, there's no Docker containers running. So I'm going to take the template here and I'm going to fork this. Oh, it looks like I already have a version there. Okay, so it looks like I already have a version there in my personal GitHub repository. Interesting. I'm just going to, um, rather than using the GitHub forking method, I'm just going to create a new repository based on based on this repository. So I'm on my local dev machine. In fact, I'm just going to go into a temporary directory. Um, uh, there we go. Good. Clone. So I'm cloning the Gatsby website. Oh. There we go. And I'm just going to clone this as is. And I'm going to rename it uh, Temp Gatsby IPFS demo there we go and you'll notice here I deleted the the git directory the hidden git directory because I'm gonna recreate it and create a new repository in my personal account so new and I'm gonna call this temp Gatsby IPFS demo So there I created a new repository <clears throat> and I am going to follow these instructions which I've done many times before. So initialize it as a git repository. I'm going to add all the existing files forked from Gatsby IPFS template. Uh, let's see. Branch. Um, I still use the old master just because so many things uh, still use it. Git push u or origin master. This is how you manually fork a repository. Uh, if the GitHub like fork button doesn't work. <clears throat> so right now it's just uploading it to GitHub. And then I'll be able, there we go. 
Okay, so we've successfully forked this Gatsby IPFS template, which is the code running uncensorablepublishing.com, into a new repository in our own personal account. So this is this is the Gatsby website that that we're going to bring live in the demo. And uh, so if I go back to the web server, I need to customize the envars file with this information. So I'm going to delete the link to the Gatsby repo, and I'm going to put in the link to the new repo we just created, and then I'm also going to tell it the name of the repo. And we'll just call this demo. And I'll leave the ports the same. That's really the only thing we need to change. We already updated the Bitcoin Cash with and public address. Okay, so now we can kick off the build. There we go. Now this is going to take uh, some time. Uh, 20 minutes maybe, 15 minutes uh, to, to build because it's essentially downloading, installing dependencies, and building the Gatsby website twice in addition to all the support software for the Docker containers. and uh, But what's nice about this is this is automated. So I'm going to stop the video here, and I'll pick it back up after the build is complete. Okay, so the Docker containers have been built on our temporary server. And we can see them running here. They kind of wrap around but we've got Tor, Nginx, and IPFS. So that's all running and we can see that the Nginx is on port 3123 and IPFS is on port 3124 so let's if we refresh the page we'll still get the normal Nginx if we switch over to HTTP and go to port 3123, uh, Firefox is trying to force us to use a, a encryption on a non-encrypted port. Uh, so that's fine. We can go ahead and just update Nginx. Um, I think that's where we left off. Yeah, update Nginx to point at that uh, port. So if I go to Nginx sites available, there's this default file which is set up to display well that uh, this this page and this is the config file for Nginx Let's load this in the, the text editor. So now that we have the Docker container running, let's comment out these files which would serve the static files and instead point the domain name at the docker container, the nginx docker container. 3123 is the port that we're using. This is a um, a private IP address that's used by docker containers. Uh, so every docker container that comes up uh, can communicate with this this IP address. And sudo move default. We'll just back up the old file. and then we'll paste those changes into the new one make sure we didn't make a typo and reboot nginx Oops. okay now if we refresh bam there we go so this is our mirror of uncensorablepublishing.com at cassateblockchain.com and uh, <clears throat> it's essentially pointing at this Nginx Docker container on port 3123. 
Now, if we look at, I'm going to go back to the root directory. Uh, so going back to the home directory, there's this Docker Gatsby web server repository that we cloned and modified. There's this new directory, Tor Keys, and that holds the essentially the private keys for your Tor service. And then there's um, a build log, which doesn't really have much information right now. But um, if we look at the logs of the demo Tor container, at the top is the onion address for our Tor container. So let's go ahead and go back to our Brave browser that's running Tor mode and paste that in and make sure that the the Tor container is working correctly. Okay, it's coming up. So the Tor container is working correctly and it's it's broadcasting the website or on the Tor network. Finally, let's check the IPFS container. Uh, demo dash IPFS and we can see that it, every minute it's uh, repeating the the hash that it came out with and here's the transaction ID of the update to the, our memo profile so if we go and ref let's see this is the one for uncensorable publishing we need to pull up the memo.cache account here so if we go to profile for this new account we created, we can see that there's been an update and that this hash that ends in IPT is the same hash being broadcast by our IPFS Docker container. Now if we go to a uh, IPFS gateway like we have here at IPFS.io, we could use any gateway and we put in this hash, we should get a copy of the website. That might help if I do that. Well, we'll let that come up. It takes time for our IPFS node to become fully connected with the other nodes on the network. And that's typically like a 10 minute process. So we'll, uh, we'll let that stew, but we've got, we've updated the Nginx config. So now that when someone goes to CAS8 blockchain, uh, the clear web version of the website is published. And now that we've got the Docker containers running and our website running, let's install a webhook. And what that does is it lets the, the Docker containers rebuild themselves when we push a change to the master branch of our code repository. And so in order to do that, we're going to need to install Node.js and NPM. So I've got some cheat sheet notes here that I'm going to pull up. So to install Node.js on a new server, I've got these cheat sheet commands. This is going to install Node.js and NPM. So Node 14 and NPM 6. So we're going to install, I'm using, I'm on an Ubuntu server by the way. Um, I, I always use Ubuntu and I recommend everyone else does because it's the one Linux version that is pretty much ubiquitous. Everybody offers it. 
Uh, so we're going to install this webhook cli npm library. The dash g means global. And because I'm on a Linux system, I needed to use the sudo command in front of it. Macs don't require the sudo command. Uh, and what webhook cli does is, is it lets us set up uh, the webhook and it can automatically interpret the types of webhooks that GitHub uses. We're also going to use npm to install pm2 which is a process manager so it'll run our webhooks in the background. Okay so let's make a directory called webhooks and I'm going to cheat again I have this installed on another server so I can just copy the configuration that way I don't have to think too hard about it but I'm going to make a file called hooks.json and then I'm going to edit that file and I'm going to copy one of these previous webhooks that I've set up. So let's take a look at that. I need to edit this. But uh, when the hook gets triggered, we're going to, this is the ID. In fact, what did we call our repository? We called it Temp Gatsby IPFS Demo. So let's go ahead and edit this as we go. This is going to be Temp Gatsby IPFS Demo. That's the ID. We're going to deploy this deploy script and it's going to be in a directory with the same name as our repository. Uh, what I really wanted to show off was this part right here, the trigger rule. This will only trigger on pushes to the master branch. Uh, so you can safely push to other branches and it's only when you uh, merge your branch into the master branch that the webhook will get triggered. Um, so let's make a scripts directory. and then make another directory for our repository and then let's do a deploy script because that's what we said we were going to do right here create a deploy script in this directory and I have <clears throat> a deploy script this is just a, a bash shell script it's very boilerplate and uh, I use the same one every time and I I barely customize it. I'm gonna comment those out. Uh, so it's grabbing my profile uh, script um, which has like things like the home uh, environment variable and other environment variables. It's going to go into that docker Gatsby web server directory into the config directory and run the build images uh, bash shell script which I showed earlier is what kicks off a new build of the docker containers or of, of the website. Oops. I wanted to rename that. Hmm. Okay, I'm going to copy this again and paste it again and save it. And then I'm going to go back into it and finish customizing it.
everything I'm doing is pretty much um, not terribly important. Um, but it does need to be executable, so I'm going to use change mod to make it executable, and I can see now it's green. Okay, so we have the webhooks are defined in hooks.json, and this it, I know this information, but in order to see what I'm doing or why I'm doing it, if you go to npmjs.com, you can go to webhook, is it webhooks or webhook cli? I think it's webhook cli. Yeah. And you can read here uh, about about the webhook uh, cli library that we're using. And uh, I also like to launch the webhooks with this shell script right here. So I'm going to go nano webhooks.sh and paste that in. And then again, make it executable. There we go, it's green. So it's going to run webhook cli. It's going to say use the hooks.json file that we created and then be verbose and run, uh, you know, be essentially like describe what you're doing. Now, PM2, if I run PM2 list, this will launch PM2, and again, you can go to npmjs.com and look up PM2 if you have not used this. But this is a very common process manager for Node.js applications. So with PM2, I'm going to start my webhook. And bring up the logs, and now I can follow it. So I can see here that the webhook started. It's listening on port 9000 for this pattern and right now it's it's got the one hook in here for uh, our repository that we've set up so let's go ahead and now that we have the webhook running on the server let's set up the webhook in our repository so going back to github to our Gatsby website repository I'll go to settings webhooks and there's nothing in here right now, so I'm going to add a webhook. And <clears throat> what is the IP address of the server? I just did if config, and I'm looking for the eth. There we go. This is the IP address of our server. And it's listening on port 9000. Notice I'm using HTTP, so no no SSL here. Um, slash hooks, and then our webhook is called Temp Gatsby IPFS Demo, and we're going to do JSON format, and we're just going to push the event, and the the webhook itself has the has the filtering for the master branch, so we don't need to add anything special to the webhook. All right, so when you do this, it's going to try and trigger the webhook, and you can see that right here. It got matched, but it didn't get triggered because this was not a push to the master branch. And uh, so that's good. That means that uh, GitHub just tried to communicate with our webhook, and, uh, and it was successfully handled. So now I think we're set up. If, uh, if I go to I think that was in the temp um, yeah there we go so here's our website so let's say we made a dip I'm gonna make a superfluous uh, change I'm just gonna change the readme oh actually which so I'm in the master branch so normally you would work from another branch like uh, um, new feature some feature branch. So if I do git status, I can see I'm I'm in the new feature branch. So now, if I go to, if I edit the readme file, I can push this change.
So that just created a, if I refresh the GitHub repo, I can see that, uh, let's see, I'm in the wrong repository. Uh, I need to go to, oh, here we go. This one here. So I can see here that there's this new feature branch and GitHub helpfully detected a uh, change. And so I'm going to create a pull request. And normally there would be, you know, like a CI checking code quality. There would be code reviews uh, that before being able to merge this PR. But if we watch our webhooks here, when we merge the branch into the master branch, we can go ahead and delete that feature branch. Uh, we'll see that it got triggered successfully. Build images, no such file or directory. Okay, so this is telling us that our webhook is not set up correctly. Um, where did it fail? Starting the deployment. No such file or directory. Trout's blog. Somehow, for some reason, it's looking. Let's check the deployment script. Yeah, right here. Right there. What is the actual... Okay, this is the directory that we need. So let's go back to the deploy script. And I'll just change it to that. Okay, so that should be good. So let's go back into PM2 logs. And we'll just add some space here. And uh, so I showed how the formal process of creating a, a PR. But for since we're just testing this, I can just uh, make a change and push directly to master as well. So I'm already in the master branch. And I have these unconfirmed un, uh, changes, so I'm going to just push them. And so it doesn't matter if GitHub's doing it or if you're manually doing it. Because I'm pushing to the master branch, or anytime I do a push, it's going to do a trigger, but or it's going to trigger the webhook. But because I'm pushing to the master branch, it's going to trigger the build. So I'm going to do that right now. And over here, we'll watch the, the webhook get triggered. So there we go. It's triggered. It's thinking. It it did not error out like it did before so that is good so it's probably working since we're not getting any output and it takes time if we look at the docker processes we can see all the images are down so that's good it took them down and, and now it's in the process of rebuilding them so our webhook was successfully triggered uh, by changing the, the website code and now our docker containers are being rebuilt and they'll automatically come back up and again start serving over the clear web, Tor, and IPFS. Okay, so that concludes the demo. Um, so what did we cover? We covered how to run, how to install and set up a web server for a Gatsby website that includes a CI/CD webhook, so we watched GitHub trigger it by by making changes to the website code that automatically republished and rebuilt these Docker containers that serve the website over Web, Tor, and IPFS. And uh, 
it's possible to turn off one of these Docker containers and leave the other ones running by editing the Docker composed YAML file. I'm not going to go into that here, but that's how you would do it. Uh, so what I'm hoping to accomplish by this is encourage website developers to build more websites that uh, that cater to these other networks. You know, so Tor is an excellent privacy network. Uh, the dark web uh, could be vastly improved with modern uh, web apps if if using this method. Uh, IPFS is a highly censorship resistant network. So you know, a good example of this that I come back to a lot is is the Wuhan. Uh, when the coronavirus was first detected, there was a lot of government censorship of important time-sensitive data during that time, and IPFS could have played a role at helping that get leak that information. And so that's a really good use of IPFS, and, and I think that building websites this way can facilitate that. And then, of course, you know, the... the the clear web that we all know and love isn't going anywhere, and that's also an excellent way to publish websites. Uh, the point here is freedom and options, and I want to give developers more freedom and more options.